Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Many of us have a dream of designing and building a new rocket system. I personally think the moon has the greatest commercial potential right now. What if an entity like the European Union asked the Academy to help build a super heavy lift rocket system, optimized for lunar exploration? Where would we start? Today we are going to look at the factors that must be considered as we try to imagine a lunar optimized rocket system that would be better than Starship. The first step in designing a rocket system is to evaluate the mission. We will define this as landing at least 100 metric tons on the moon in a single launch. To get to the moon, we launch from Earth into a translunar injection orbit. This can be split into two steps, going into low Earth orbit, which takes about 9,400 meters per second of delta V, to get the 7,800 meters per second of orbital velocity needed to stay in a stable orbit. Then we would need to add about 4,100 meters per second of delta V to extend this orbit out to the moon. It is also possible to launch straight to the moon. This adds about 3,660 meters per second to the 9,400 meters per second of launch delta V, which would combine to be about 13,060 meters per second. The estimated delta V needed to land on the moon varies. Using values from the Apollo landers, which are published by NASA, we see that the lowest possible delta V to land on the moon would be 1,736 meters per second. To have a healthy safety margin, the Apollo missions budgeted 2,125 meters per second. With modern computers, it is argued that 2,050 meters per second is reasonable. We'll use that value. We also need to complete a lunar orbit insertion burn, also called a capture burn. The Apollo values for this varies from 400 to 700 meters per second. We'll use 700 and go back to our delta V equation. We start solving our problem by working backwards. Here you see a 100 metric ton payload landed on the moon. It could be a habitat, a commercial regolith mining rover, or perhaps an ice mining and processing machine. We could start with unmanned autonomous or remote controlled systems, leasing out the habitats and selling the products to nations and companies. Here we picture our landed product on the moon. Here's a habitat with power systems and supplies having a total mass of 100 tons. Now we start working backwards. Delta V equals exhaust velocity times the natural log of initial mass over final mass. We know that our client, the European Union, is interested in methane-fueled rocket engines, as they just completed testing of their new M10 expander cycle engine. This engine was built in Italy and produces 98 kilonewtons at 362 seconds of specific impulse. Specific impulse in space is determined by exhaust velocity of the propellant when it leaves the rocket engine nozzle. The longer the nozzle, the better the performance in space, but the higher the mass. Vacuum optimized rocket engines are mostly nozzle. There are other engine options available in Europe to consider. Pangaea Aerospace has developed a working methane fueled aerospike engine. I personally think that aerospike engines will become the industry standard within a decade or so. Elon recently said that aerospikes weren't necessary on a two stage rocket. I disagree. The simplicity of having the exact same engine for launch and space operations, added to the increased efficiency of aerospikes in atmosphere, and the mass savings in vacuum when you get rid of this giant nozzle, will make aerospike engines unbeatable eventually. You also have to consider that the active cooling system is inherent in the aerospike design, whereas it takes a lot of plumbing and mass to cool a bell nozzle. The current Pangaea Pathfinder engine is open cycle. This may seem like a waste, but expelling turbo pump exhaust down the central plug can increase efficiency of an aerospike in atmosphere. Aerospikes are, however, best suited for expander cycle engines. Pangaea has plans to scale their engines up with a 200 kilonewton version and then perhaps a 2000 kilonewton. Aerospikes scale up better than bell nozzles do. 
SpaceX is expecting to get a specific impulse of 380 to 383 seconds for a vacuum raptor. Let's go with 380 seconds and get back to our equation. We convert specific impulse to exhaust velocity by multiplying by Earth's gravity. 380 seconds times 9.807 meters per second squared gives us 3,727 meters per second. Now we know the final mass, and we want to solve for the initial mass. That requires a little algebra. Delta V divided by exhaust velocity equals the natural log of initial mass over final mass. The inverse of the natural log is the constant E, 2.7183, to the power of x. So E to the power of delta V over exhaust velocity equals initial mass over final mass. Finally, we multiply both sides by final mass to get it over here, canceling it out here. Now we have the equation we need. Initial mass equals final mass times E to the power of delta V over exhaust velocity. Putting in the known values, we get an initial mass of 173,377 kilograms. That means if we want to land 100 tons on the moon, with methane engines operating at 380 seconds of specific impulse, we need to start in low lunar orbit with a little more than 173 tons. Now we go backwards again. We are going to use the moon's gravity to slow us down when we come in on our translunar injection orbit. But assuming we still need 700 meters per second for lunar orbit insertion, we use the same equation with our new values to get a mass of 209,217 kilograms. This means that as our ship comes toward the moon, it will need to have a mass of just over 209 tons. It will burn just over 35.8 tons to get into orbit, leaving it with just over 173 tons. Then it will burn over 73 tons to land on the moon with 100 tons. We could use hydrogen-fueled engines for the moon landing instead of methane. If we use the efficient RL-10 Hydrolox engines by Aerojet Rocketdyne, we would have a specific impulse of around 460 seconds. That would give us an exhaust velocity of 4,511 meters per second. Using those values, we see that landing 100 tons on the moon from low lunar orbit would take only about 157.5 tons. That means we could burn 57.5 tons of hydrogen oxygen propellant or 73.4 tons of methane propellant to get our 100 tons onto the moon's surface. We'll try to stay with methane for simplicity, but if we have the volume for large tanks, we might switch to hydrogen to reduce the needed mass. Going back to clarify, we are going to try to use methane, which means that to get 100 tons on the surface of the moon, we will drop out of low lunar orbit with a mass of 173,377 kilograms. When I say low lunar orbit, I don't mean a stable circular orbit. I mean we came in from our translunar injection orbit, in front of the moon so its gravity pulled us back to reduce our capture burn. We used 700 meters per second to get effective capture, so the moon's gravity starts pulling us down to the surface. We burn 2,050 meters per second delta V to fight that gravity so we can land safely. If our translunar injection burn takes 3,660 meters per second of delta V, after we burn the 9,400 to leave Earth and get into space, we can use our equation again to see that we need 558,834 kilograms of initial mass to make that burn. This is much more than any rocket that has ever launched. The Saturn V, still the most powerful rocket ever used, could only get 140 metric tons, or 140,000 kilograms, to orbit. The mass of the Apollo Service and Command Module was about 16.5 tons, and the mass of the lunar lander was from 15.2 to 16.4 tons. This means the Apollo system had to get 33 metric tons headed to the moon. We need to get an order of magnitude more. We need a really big rocket. A friend of mine studying aerospace science at Harvard University is interested in space industry investing. He has a channel where he evaluates space companies. We'll have a link in the description. He was wondering about the feasibility of a very large rocket system. This is the Phalanx rocket system. It is designed to have a diameter of 12 meters and a total stacked height of 180 meters. Let's evaluate this system and see if this rocket would work for our needs. First, let's decide what to build it out of. To do that, we need to estimate the structural mass. If the booster is 110 meters tall, and we can calculate the perimeter by multiplying the diameter times pi, 
coming up with 38 meters. We can multiply 110 times 38, which would equal 4,147 square meters of surface area on the cylinder here. Now we know we will need a thrust dome, a common dome to separate our liquid methane from liquid oxygen, and a top dome. We can calculate the area of this cylinder to estimate the size of the needed dome. We get the area by the equation radius squared times pi. The radius of a 12 meter diameter rocket is 6 meters. Squaring this gives us 36 meters. And multiplying by pi gives us 113 square meters. Since this will be a dome instead of being flat, let's bump this up to 125 square meters of surface area. Since we will need three of these, that's 375 square meters. We add 375 to 4,147 and get 4,522 square meters of surface area. If we go with a 5 millimeter thickness for our metal, we will get a total of 22.61 cubic meters of metal. How much mass would that be? And what if we want this rocket to survive re-entry for reuse? If this is the case, we will avoid losing aluminum for the skin, as it cannot withstand much heat. Though we could use it for internal structures. We could consider heat tiles, like the Space Shuttle, which was made mostly of aluminum, and the SpaceX Starship, but I prefer active cooling with liquid methane, rejecting the heat and the fuel through the engine, helping us slow down and cool down at the same time. The two alloys that might work best for this application would be titanium and steel. The density of most titanium alloys is about 4,420 kilograms per cubic meter. The density of steel alloys would be 8,000 kilograms per cubic meter. That would be almost 100 tons for the titanium and almost 181 tons for the steel. Titanium is not really stronger than steel, but it is much lighter. So let's go with the titanium. Our booster dry mass starts at 99,934 kilograms. Now we need to add engines. This design shows around 42 engines. An aerospike engine has much less mass than a conventional engine of the same power. The SpaceX Raptor currently has a mass of about 1.6 tons. Let's go with 1.5 to be safe, since I think we are going to need some pretty big engines. 42 of these engines will have a combined mass of 63 tons. If we add that to the 99,934 kilograms, we get 162,934 kilograms, so 163 tons. Let's add a little more than 37 tons to bring it to an even 200. If we come in a little lighter, okay but this goal is our maximum. SpaceX is going for 180 tons for their booster, but they're using steel. A booster of steel this size would be about 250 tons, and may be a cheaper option if we can afford the mass. Now let's look at our tanks. If we allow 5 meters at the base for the engine and equipment bay, and 5 meters at the top for the dome, release mechanisms, and fin controls, the designer here prefers solid fins to grid fins, that would make the tanks a combined 100 meters tall. How much of this tank should be methane and how much oxygen? Let's look at how we figure this out. Liquid oxygen is 1,250 kilograms per cubic meter. Liquid methane is 484 kilograms per cubic meter. The oxidizer to fuel ratio, or OFR, is 3.4 for the M10 and about 3.7 for the Raptor. That means for every this many kilograms of oxygen, we will need one kilogram of methane. Let's go with a ratio of 3.5. Now if we divide the oxygen density by this value and divide the methane density by 1, the kilograms cancel and we get these values. Taking the inverse of these gives us cubic meters to cubic meters. If we divide each number by the sum of both numbers, we get this ratio. That means we need 57% of our tank to be liquid oxygen and 43% liquid methane. That tells us where to put our common dome and it helps us calculate our propellant mass. If our booster has 100 meters of tank height and an area of 113 square meters, it has a volume of about 11,300 cubic meters. Minus a little bit for structural items, but that's a good guess. Now we multiply that total volume by the LOX fraction and we get 6,441 cubic meters of liquid oxygen tank volume and 4,859 cubic meters in the methane tank. Multiplying these by the density of these propellants gives us about 8,051 and 2,352 tons respectively. Now we get a total final mass, adding our dry mass and our propellants, of a little more than 10,600 tons. Now we look at the second stage. It would be about 70 meters tall. 
We can use that to calculate the surface area again, and just use the formula for a cylinder, knowing that this conic section would reduce the actual value, and using that difference for structural support. And we get this surface area. We add in our domes, still three, and get 3,014 square meters total area. At five millimeters of thickness, we get 15.07 cubic meters of metal. That comes out to 66,608 kilograms, or about 66.6 .6 tons. We see 12 engines here, and that mass comes out to 18 tons. Let's estimate extra mass for piping and baffles, and set our goal second stage dry mass at no more than 100 tons. If we have 40 meters of tank and 30 meters of payload space, that works out to this much propellant mass, using these ratios. Now we can look back at the mass we need to leave Earth orbit with. 559 tons. And we'll bump that up to 600 tons for a safety margin. Now our total mass is about 15.5 thousand tons. This is three times the mass of the SpaceX Starship. That mass works out to a weight of about 152 meganewtons. If we want a thrust to weight ratio of 1.5, each booster aero spike will need to produce about 5.4 meganewtons. This would need to be an engine more than twice as powerful as a Raptor 2. But there is no reason to believe this is not possible. In fact, the amazing Saturn V F1 rocket engines, built by our grandparents' generation, produced 6.7 meganewtons at sea level and 7.7 .7 meganewtons in vacuum. If we can't pull off 5.4 meganewtons a half century later, we need to hang it up. At that power, and with 12 engines on our second stage, we would get a thrust to weight ratio of 1.36. Gravity drag is less of a problem for the second stage, so this is okay. Now we launch our rocket. We burn 95% of our propellant mass in the booster, and at MECO we have produced about 3.6 kilometers per second of delta V. We drop the booster and its reserve fuel, and it goes back to land. We have a new mass of 4,865 tons. We burn 95% of that propellant, and have a burnout mass of 908 tons, giving us a total final delta V of 9.85 kilometers per second. Now the fairing of the second stage opens, releasing the third stage, which is our lunar landing vehicle. It fires to head on out to the moon, and the second stage falls back toward Earth. At this point, it might be easier to do a once-around elliptical partial orbit and come back to land at the launch site. The space shuttle could do this, and it was called abort to orbit. Now our third stage fires its engines to go to the moon. A translunar injection burn takes at least 3,660 meters per second, and sometimes up to 4,100 meters per second, depending on where you start and other factors. Putting yourself in a stable circular orbit burns some propellant, costing you delta V. But let's start with our mass of 600 metric tons and reverse our previous formula to see how much mass we get to the moon. Delta V equals exhaust velocity times the natural log of initial mass over final mass. Solving for final mass, we get delta V over exhaust velocity equals the natural log of initial mass over final mass. E to the power of delta V over exhaust velocity equals initial mass over final mass. And we end up with final mass equals initial mass divided by E to the power of delta V over VE. E, remember, is 2.7183 and our exhaust velocity with a specific impulse of 380 seconds is 3,727 meters per second. Putting in those values we get 225 tons at best and 200 tons at worst. Now we do our capture burn of 700 meters per second and we get 186 to 165 and a half tons to start our landing burn. We bring that down on the moon and end up with 107 to 95 tons. Assuming the worst case scenario, we would be cutting it very close. If we have the volume in the second stage fairing, and we should since this thing is 10 stories tall, we can plan to use liquid hydrogen fuel for the lander. Using Hydrolox RL-10s, we would get 460 seconds of specific impulse instead of the 380 seconds the methane engines produced. Let's see how that works out. Now when we fire to the moon, we have 600 tons with an efficiency of 460 seconds of specific impulse. That gives us an exhaust velocity of 4,511 meters per second, and assuming a delta V for the translunar injection of 4,100 meters per second, we end up arriving near the moon with almost 242 tons. Our capture burn takes us down to 207 tons, 
Then our landing burn of 2,050 meters per second of delta V lets us put over 131 tons on the moon. Now we go back to our client and let them know. If they use a methane-fueled lunar lander, they can probably get 100 tons on the moon. But if they design a hydrogen-fueled lunar lander and launch it with a phalanx methane rocket system, they can get up to 130 tons on the lunar surface in one launch. No refueling flights. Here is what the lander might look like. It would fit in the payload bay and would land itself, much like the alpaca lander. If we have 130 tons on the moon, the weight would only be one-sixth that of Earth. 1,275 kilonewtons versus 211 kilonewtons. The RL-10 engines put out 100 kilonewtons each, so four of these could easily land this much mass. Or we could use aerospikes like those shown here. Once our client is convinced that the mission is feasible, a letter of intent could be signed between Phalanx and the European Union. With this letter, Phalanx could then go to a venture capitalist and get funding to develop their lunar-optimized super rocket. There are, of course, a million problems and details that will have to be worked out. This is just the beginning of determining if your planned spaceship or mission is feasible. But if I were in control of the European Space Agency, I would quit thinking small and start thinking big. Now I'm going to let Nathan from Launch Window Research explain why that might be a good investment for all of us. So where do you start designing a new rocket? New rocket. What ironic so where do you start designing a new rocket? What well, ironically you don't start at the rocket. So where do you start designing a new rocket? Well, ironically, you don't start at the rocket. You start at the satellite and all the spacecraft that you need to launch. And then you start the design process around that. Welcome back to Launch Window Research. Today, I want to talk to you about the future of the launch market. Right now, the space community is captivated by the development of the SpaceX Starship. Not only will this vehicle be fully reusable, but it will also be a super heavy lift vehicle more powerful than anything that's been created in the past. Now, this vehicle was designed to help humanity colonize the solar system, and because it was designed for this goal, it's not exactly optimized to fit current market needs. Based on the data, small satellites have been taking up a larger and larger portion of the launch market by upmass, and other partially and fully reusable vehicles that are being designed are being designed at this smaller scale to fit current demand. So what's going on here? And will this trend continue or will the market slowly shift its demand to meet super heavy launch capabilities? I believe that the latter will happen and I will give you a detailed explanation as to why. In this video, I will break down the entire projected future of the launch market going from current satellite constellations all the way up to large scale operations on the moon and Mars. Most of the information in this video I have gotten from interviewing key industry minds right here on this YouTube channel. After this video, I will leave a link to the playlist of those interviews if you're interested. But with that said, let's go. So why is it important to make these economic projections in the first place? Well, space is massive and space colonization is a massive money pit. It will efficiently eat up any government money or personal fortune that you throw at it. Thus, the only sustainable way to explore space is to turn a profit doing so. While it is theoretically possible to explore space without turning a profit, your exploration efforts will forever be tethered by the fixed amount of government or private money that you're able to put in. However, once you're able to make a profit, and thus make back more money than you spend, there is no limit to how much money you can put in. Thus, your colonization efforts can reach untethered exponential levels of growth. This is hands down the quickest way to colonize the solar system. So how exactly do we turn a profit in space? Well, there are already several ventures that do this. And I think Justice Killian from Space Capital did a great job of explaining it during our interview with him. Space largely is, you know, from, a, from an investing perspective, it's about data. And there's three main areas where there's opportunity. One is um, built on GPS technology, which is around positioning and timing. The second major vertical is around um, geospatial intelligence and imagery. And then the last is, is really what a lot of people um, have heard, you know, from a SpaceX perspective or an Amazon perspective is 
satellite communications. So that is the current way the space industry is able to make a profit, but how does that tie into the current launch market? Over the past few decades, digital technology has gotten exponentially smaller. Thus, what used to require a satellite the size of a school bus can now be accomplished with a satellite the size of a lunchbox. However, I believe that this has led to a pretty big misconception in the space industry. There has recently been a massive trend towards smaller satellites in the space industry, because people think that the future of space infrastructure will be satellites with the same capability as legacy satellites, but at one thousandth the size. However, the more likely scenario for the future will be satellites of the same size as past satellites, but 1,000 times the capability. Yes, satellites have gotten a whole lot more powerful in recent decades. However, our demand for data here on Earth has compounded at a similar rate, if not a greater one. But there's also another reason why satellites will not continue to shrink, and that is power generation. If a satellite needs to collect a high volume of imagery or transmit data at a rapid rate, it will simply require a lot of power. And while most computational electronics have gotten significantly smaller, there is no real way to shrink the size of the solar arrays required to generate power. Thus, as these markets mature, I do expect this trend to reverse and for satellites to get bigger once again. We can already see this trend beginning to materialize with Starlink version 2, as each satellite will weigh over 1200 kilograms. And the size and quantity of these satellites makes Starship the only vehicle that could realistically deploy this type of constellation. But there is one more trend in the satellite market that will move to favor larger and larger rockets, and that is orbital refueling. Right now, the current plan is to replace Starlink satellites roughly every five years or so. And yes, replacing satellites does provide an opportunity to upgrade them with the latest technology. However, once the industry matures, it's not going to make sense to replace your satellites every five years. Just in the same way it makes sense to land and reuse your rockets, it will make sense to refuel and reuse your satellites. Also, satellites are getting bigger, more numerous, and are flying at lower altitudes where their orbits will decay more rapidly. And for all of those reasons, it's going to make more and more economic sense to put in place orbital refueling infrastructure. One such company working on this problem is OrbitFab, and I hope to secure an interview with them in the near future. But tying this back to the launch market, once orbital refueling infrastructure is in place, widely dispersed deployments of satellites along many inclinations will be replaced by bulk deliveries of fuel to orbital waypoints along just a few key inclinations. From there, autonomous space tugs can take care of the rest. In other words, orbital refueling will decrease the number of relevant destinations in space and will economically benefit large infrequent launches over numerous small launches. So all of that is great and all, but if the space industry wants to expand into deep space, it will have to start providing value in the form of things that are not data. So when it comes to the export of physical commodities back to Earth, there are two routes to take. There is space mining and space manufacturing. And I want to say that I do believe that both will come to pass, however, there is a key economic difference between the two that leads me to believe that space manufacturing will come first and be more helpful overall to building the railroad to space. So the thing about space mining is that with the exception of a few edge cases, the majority of things that are in space can also be found on Earth. That means that any space mining operation would have to compete with existing Earth mining operations, and that any space mining venture won't be profitable until the cost of extracting materials from space becomes lower than the cost of extracting materials from Earth. Now, contrast that with space manufacturing. Space manufacturing is appealing because the environment of microgravity allows us to manufacture things that simply cannot be manufactured here in Earth's gravity. I asked space venture capitalist Jonathan Lacoste about the prospects of space manufacturing, and he had this to say. I think space manufacturing has the ability to be quite massive and disruptive. Now, I'll, I'll caveat that by saying it'll be a while before you have regular day-to-day -day items like manufactured in space, right? Um, there has to be a economic benefit in a, in a actual physical, like physics-based benefit to manufacturing something in space. And so what Space Forge has figured out, and it's actually based on 60-year-old research in the International Space Station, is that when you're 3D printing kind of a silicon wafer component that goes into a semiconductor chip, 
you can actually get the transistors to be much more closely mixed and put together on a wafer when it's in zero gravity compared to when it's on Earth. We've basically hit the limit of what's possible with the, the constraints of friction and, and gravity here on Earth. And so that's an example of something where there's a massive existing market and it really comes down to their ability to execute it from a technological standpoint, but the market is there. And so they actually have their first launch this year. So a semiconductor chip manufactured in space does not have to compete with the Earth-based supply of semiconductors. And that is because Earth-based chips cannot compete on the basis of quality. What that means is that you can set your own prices and be profitable from the very start. If you are a space mining business and the first pound of gold you produce costed $1 million to extract, then you still have to sell that at market prices, which is $22,000. However, if you are a space manufacturing business and manufacture your first semiconductor chip, it does not matter if it costed $1 million to manufacture because you can probably sell it for $2 million or even more. What I predict is that the mere difference of having control over your prices creates a thousandfold difference between these two industries. You could probably start a successful space manufacturing company for tens of millions of dollars. Contrast that with space mining, which you would probably have to pour tens of billions of dollars in before you could reach net profitability. Remember, unlocking exponential growth is all about reaching profitability as quickly as possible. So that's why I think space manufacturing will come first. But assuming that's the case, what does that mean for the launch market? Well, space manufacturing can take place anywhere in orbit. So instead of having launches that have to go to various ranges of inclinations and pitches, all of your launch volume can instead be concentrated on a single easy to reach place in low earth orbit. Additionally, once the space industry begins producing commodities, there will finally be a demand for routine cargo shipments to and from space. There will be a constant upstream of raw materials and a constant downstream of finished products. And once that happens, the entire concept of sizing rockets to fit their expected payloads will go out the window entirely. It will just become a game of maximizing the amount of payload you can get to and from orbit efficiently, in which case it'll make sense to build the biggest rocket you possibly can. So you're probably surprised that I've gotten this far into the video without talking about the launch demands for building colonies on other worlds. And I think that I simply don't have to. It is quite obvious that building any large presence on another celestial body will require a very massive launch vehicle. However, I will say that the current plan for Starship is to refuel it in low Earth orbit and then send it off to further destinations in deep space, and I don't see that architecture sticking around for particularly long if it even gains prominence in the first place. Atmospheric re-entry here on Earth is such a demanding task that any craft designed for it is probably not going to be able to compete with a craft that is designed to operate exclusively in space. So I expect future launch vehicles to be optimized for low Earth orbit and low Earth orbit alone. From there, they can deploy a highly efficient, non-aerodynamic third stage that can go out and explore the solar system. And I have actually recently worked on such a design with Terran Space Academy. If you haven't seen their video on it, you absolutely must check it out now. Trying to design a craft with near-future technologies that could surpass Starship was a very intellectually stimulating challenge. But besides that, if you're interested in binging the interviews that informed a lot of my knowledge on the space industry, I'll leave a link to that playlist as well. Take care, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for listening and stay safe at Astro Proterra.